Let me ask you this morning, what are you really searching for in life? I'm not asking what are you presently doing with your life, nor am I asking what do you ultimately want to do in your life. I'm asking when you peel back all of the layers of your personality and gifts and talents and interests and pursuits and desires, do you know what you're really longing for? I'm of the conviction that most people do not know what their deepest longing really is. And therefore, like Henry David Thoreau once said, most men live lives of quiet desperation and they go to the grave with the song still in their hearts. Did you get what he was saying? Most people deep down in their souls are longing for something that they haven't found yet. And sadly, Thoreau was of the persuasion that most men will go to their graves without the real song in their hearts ever having come out. And even those who understand what William Harley advocated in his best-selling book, His Needs, Her Needs, and that is, figuratively speaking, every one of us has inside of us this love bank. And every person we encounter, and every relationship that we have, and every comment that's made, and everything that we do or don't do or is done to us or is not done to us, is either making deposits into our love bank or taking withdrawals from that bank. And just like our checking account, Harley says if one or more of the five love busters happen to us during the course of the day, if someone is selfish or makes a selfish demand on us or is disrespectful, or makes a disrespectful judgment about us or about someone else, or if there's an angry outburst that is directed either to us or if we lose it over something or with someone, or if somebody does something that annoys us, then Harley says those are huge withdrawals that seriously affect us. And when we have more withdrawals than deposits, Harley says we're in serious trouble. The vast majority of people don't understand that. But even for those of us who do, I believe the vast majority of us are like the old Waylon Jennings song that says we're looking for love in all the wrong places and looking for love in too many places, longing for what we've been dreaming of and still never quite finding it. Listen closely, we will never feel the deepest hole and ache in our heart until we truly understand what we're really searching for and then make the appropriate response that will fill our deepest longing and keep us singing as we go. There are numerous reasons why I'm glad that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. We've had the privilege of communing together and approaching the throne of grace together. We've blended our voices together in praise to our God as we've encouraged one another, not only by our presence and not only by greeting the people whom we've already spoken to, but we have encouraged one another by singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to each other as well reminding each other of the great truths that we have sung as we're in this journey of life together. We've had the privilege of bringing the financial gift that we have pre-planned and purposed in our hearts to give in advance to the greatest giver who has entrusted everything that he has given to us for his good pleasure 
and for us to advance the cause of the kingdom as we help not only the kingdom but the poor and the orphans and the widows and the needy. It's already been a good day if we stop right now. But I'm also glad you're here this morning because you're going to get to hear something from the Word of God that the vast majority of people and quite possibly the vast majority of Christians simply do not understand. But they and we all need to understand it. Because it has the potential to bring about that aha moment that could transform and revolutionize our lives by enlightening us to the one thing that would really scratch our deepest itch and quench our deepest thirst. Then when you know what that is, and I'm going to tell you in just a moment, then you can choose whether you believe it's true or not. And it is because it comes from the God who cannot lie. And then if you come down on the side of truth, that what I'm telling you today is the truth, then if you decide to do what the text calls us to do about it, then your life from this moment on will forever be changed because you'll be in touch and in tune with what most people in the world and what most people in the church simply do not understand. So let me ask it one more time. What are you really searching for in life? The answer is found in one sentence in the Old Testament, and it's found in the familiar story that we're going to study this morning from Acts chapter 17. So let's open our Bibles there together. The Apostle Paul is on his second missionary journey here in the middle of Acts 17. And like we studied two weeks ago, his dream and his goal was to go to Asia and preach the unsearchable riches of Christ in Bithynia. But God had other plans for him. So the Holy Spirit prevented Paul from going to Bithynia and Paul being open to the Spirit doesn't try to stubbornly plow through a door that God has closed, but instead, like every Christian should, Paul goes where the Spirit leads and where, and he goes through the doors that God opens for him. So Paul ends up in Troas, which becomes a springboard for him to take the gospel into Europe, which wasn't on Paul's radar screen, by the way. But it's where God wanted him to be all along. So when we come to the middle of this chapter, Paul has just left Silas and Timothy in Berea. And Paul comes walking now into one of the most historically important cities of the world, the city of Athens, Greece. The concept of democracy originated in Athens. And those of us who are blessed to live in a democracy owe a great debt of gratitude to these creative and innovative and visionary thinkers. Athens was the home of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, and is still considered to be the home of the great philosophers of the world. But much of Athens' glory was in her past. As I've often mentioned, I'm a former history teacher and I love to read about and study our past. I believe if we don't know about our past, then we don't have a true appreciation for the sacrifices that have been made so that we can enjoy the blessings that we presently enjoy. And secondly, if we do not know the past, then in all likelihood we are doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past. And that's true with nations, and it's also true in families, and it's also true with congregations. I have a deep appreciation for our past. And we stand on the shoulders of faithful men and women who sacrifice greatly so that we can enjoy the blessings of being cross point today. But make no mistake about it. 
we cannot live in the past. We must understand the past, but we must see history as His story. And we must look at our individual life story in relationship to His story. That's what the great philosophers were trying to figure out. They were trying to figure out their place in the great cosmos, in the great story. And they were all over the place. And each philosopher had a philosophy and a following. Athens was also home to one of the three greatest universities in the world along with the one in Alexandria and Egypt and Tarsus in Cilicia. But here's the point. These highly intellectual people who knew about so many things and were such deep thinkers and were searching for the meaning of so many things, they did not know what their deepest needs were, nor did they know who or what could fill it. So try to picture the scene. After Paul says goodbye to the brethren who graciously brought him to the seaport town of Athens, which is about five miles from the heart of the city, Paul begins to walk into the city. One of the first sights he would have seen would have been the Acropolis, which simply means the high city. This area was the ancient citadel that was located high on a rocky hill overlooking the city. It was home to numerous buildings and temples and libraries. Everything was built up here as a place of refuge so that her citizens could go and live there and enjoy life and be safe in the event of an attack on the city over time. This area became the hub of the city, it became the place to be, the place to be seen, the place to go, the place to shop, the place to hang out, the place to engage people, the place to have a conversation about any and everything. And right in the center was the dazzling Parthenon, which was considered by many to be the most beautiful building ever fashioned by human hands even though the Greeks would get an argument from the Jews about that. Because the Jews believed that the temple was the most beautiful building that man had ever constructed, but the Greeks believed it was this temple. This temple that they had dedicated to the one whom the Greeks believed to be one of the three virgin goddesses, the goddess Athena. In fact, there were two statues dedicated to her. One was inside the Parthenon, and then there was a huge one outside the Parthenon. And that statue to Athena was so large that history says that if you were on the seaport or the seacoast where Paul came in five miles away, you could look up and you could see the reflection coming off of her statue and the spear she was holding up. Five miles away. She was dazzling. So try to picture the scene. While Paul was waiting, verse 16 says, for them, that's Silas and Timothy, while he's waiting for them to come in Athens, he's greatly disturbed to see that the city was full of idols. Everywhere he turned, Paul saw people engaged in conversation with one another, in celebrations with each other, buying and selling and getting gain. And he also saw hundreds of idols and numerous temples that were dedicated to specific Greek gods, including one that history said was still under construction and ultimately would be dedicated to the Greek god Zeus. One historian said it was easier to find a god than a man in Athens, and that's a mouthful. Verse 23 tells us that Paul even passed an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. So instead of being awed by the city's beauty and bustle and grandeur and attractions, 
Paul's greatly disturbed deep down in his spirit because Paul looks at everything through the eyes and the lens of God. And that's the worldview that we're called to have that should shape everything about how we look at everything that we see, but often doesn't. So in the law language of one writer, when Paul looks and sees all that's going on here in this city, he saw what this writer referred to as spiritual pornography. The danger and the trap for us this morning is to be lulled into the thinking, well, that's Athens. But the reality is this, there are hundreds of idols today that vie for our attention and affection. Oh, they're not sculpted with bronze or gold-plated images or iron that we bow down to. But so many of us can be driven by other idols, like material things or money or pleasure or career or power or status or control or intelligence or even religion or even tradition, and on and on I could go. So when Paul sees all of this, his spirit is greatly disturbed. And verse 17 tells us that he immediately goes to the synagogue and he reasons with the Jews and with the God-fearing Greeks. And every day, probably then Sunday through Friday, he goes and does the same out in the marketplace. Among those whom Paul engages in conversation were advocates of two ways of living. They were the Epicureans and the Stoics. The Epicureans were followers of the Greek philosopher Epicurus, who lived from 340 to 270 B.C. His philosophy was this, since everything happens by chance, then pursue pleasure. And what's pleasure? It's anything that can eliminate or anything that can reduce pain and suffering. And it's anything that can begin to fill the hole in your heart. So his philosophy was go for it. And in the language of some who are quoted in 1 Corinthians 15, 32, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. The people who bought into this philosophy were over the top. They got no boundaries. And they bought it hook, line, and sinker. So they lived it up. Now, to counter that world view, the followers of the Greek philosopher Zeno, who was a contemporary of Epicurus, the one who advocated that philosophy, another philosopher came on the scene, Zeno, and he advocated an entirely different philosopher. He did a 180, which is what, by the way, many people do when they see things they don't agree with. What do they do? The tendency is to avoid this extreme, so we go to this extreme. And that's what he did. These people who followed him were called the Stoics, because the Greek word stoa meant porch. And the philosopher Zeno would sit out in these open air but covered porches along these temples and a crowd would gather and he would advocate his philosophy of life, his worldview, that he believed everybody should follow. He believed that the gods were impersonal forces that had already determined your fate and your destiny. So you just need to accept your fate and be indifferent about what's going to happen because what's going to happen is going to happen. Que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. And so since it's going to happen and you've got no control about anything, then you need to be indifferent about everything because it's just going to happen anyway. And not only be indifferent, but you might as well be serious 
about life and serious about denying your flesh and your desires. So these Stoics walked around with hangdog faces. They were unemotional, and people would look at them and they'd see how serious they are, and they would go, oh my, look at that man. Look at that lady. Man, she's serious about life, and guess what happened to their head? It got big and swelled with pride. Can you see the two extremes? Sadly, both exalt man and neither exalt God. So after reasoning with people who had bought into this philosophy day after day after day, the followers, the people who are listening to Paul, are not getting what he's advocating, which is what? According to verse 18, Paul is advocating following the resurrected Jesus. That's the key, he says, to real living. Paul's teaching that there's a much better way to live and approach life, and that's to follow Jesus and live for Jesus and love like Jesus loved and love what he loved and understand and then experience the power of the resurrection. So the followers of those two philosophies take Paul to a meeting of the Areopagus, which is the compound Greek word that comes from the Roman god Mars and the Greek god for war, and it translates into hill, so literally it meant a little mountain or little hill, so they called this place Mars Hill. It was located at the foot of the Acropolis, where the most prestigious group of thinkers met. History says this was where Socrates and Plato and Aristotle taught. This was where Socrates was tried and then convicted for being what they called back then a perverter of religion. Paul is taken then to this court of group of high thinkers, and he's asked to speak to all of these intelligent people. Would you listen to what he said to them? The God who made the world, and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in temples built by hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men that they would inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our very being. As some of your poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we're God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image man made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. For he set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he's given proof of all of this to all men by raising him from the dead. That, my brothers and sisters, is spot on. Paul says to them, I know that you are religious, but listen closely, there is a big difference between being religious and being at the heart of God. Paul says, I want to tell you about God. I want to tell you about the creative God who created all things. And whether you realize it or admit it or not, He's the Lord of heaven, Lord of earth, and He doesn't need anything. But He made and created and gave life to every one of us from one man. He made every nation, and His original intent was for all of us to live together in peace and harmony and unity and join Him in what He's doing to restore things on this fallen earth like they are in heaven. And Paul says, intellectually, Paul says to these Epicureans, you're way off base. Because God never intended everything to revolve around you. 
And Paul then looks at the Stoics and he says, even though you don't see this, you're missing it too. God's working here. He's always been at work. In fact, He's the one who determined when and where we're all born. He's always been at work. And not only is He working this world, but He's at work in your life. And I'll add, as Mordecai of old said, who knows but what you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So here's our lesson this morning. Most people do not understand the one thing that every single person in this world and every single person who's ever been created is really seeking. Are you ready? Here it is. According to Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 11, God has put eternity in our hearts. So deep within the depth of every heart and soul is this desire to seek and find God and to know Him and experience what it's like to not only be in His presence, like Moses sought and experienced once on the mountain, but to take this eternal and spiritual longing that the God of this universe put in our hearts and to just open our hearts up to Him to see what He'll do to fill that longing that most people are looking to fill in all the wrong places. And in the words of one of our newer songs, that's what makes my heart want to sing. Make sure you understand this. Everything else is secondary and will never truly satisfy. And yet, the vast majority of people in the world, the vast majority of Christians, are longing to fill that hole in our hearts with something else. So some look and turn to drugs to fill it. Some look and turn to another person thinking that that person will fill my deepest longing. And others turn to pursuing money. And others turn to religion, thinking that that will satisfy. And on and on I could go. But none of it lasts, nor does it fill our deepest longing, because our deepest need was put there from God, and it's for Him. Verse 28 says, you can underline it in your Bible, in Him we live and move and have our very being. And people have been trying to figure that out ever since the fall back in Genesis chapter 3. Since we're all fallen people and sinful people and fellow strugglers who are bruised and broken by the fall, God provided the difference maker. And the difference maker is Jesus. And most people just do not understand that either. So here on Mars Hill, Paul is calling the self-righteous and he's calling the selfish to understand this and then to repent. And what is repentance? It is godly sorrow that I didn't get this sooner. And that's why I've been trying all these other things and they've never really satisfied. And then it's a turning from all of those things to God Himself. And once you get a taste for Him, you'll hunger and thirst for more. And He'll just keep pouring out Himself into you. And this way of living, my church family, is so liberating. It's so freeing. And Paul has experienced it firsthand. And he wants everyone to discover and experience it as well. The question this morning is, do you understand it now? Paul then closes with a reminder about the great judgment scene when we will all stand before the resurrected Jesus just as we are without one plea. But that His blood was shed for me. And then therefore, when I'm in that blood and covered with that blood and dressed in His righteousness alone, 
That's when I and we stand faultless before the throne. And that's when we also then leave, not as perfect people, but we leave this assembly with a song in our hearts and love for our brothers and sisters and love for our neighbors who never have experienced this abundant life. And that's when we live abundantly in step with the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. So the million dollar question, where the rubber meets the road this morning is this, what's your response going to be? Verse 32 said, some when they heard this sneered. Others put off making a decision, a serious commitment and a surrender to pursuing God. But a few, a few believed, became followers of Jesus, became brothers and sisters with Paul. They'll walk hand in hand with God and they'll let Him fill their every longing. And He'll keep them singing as they go. It all can come when you open yourself up to that truth that your greatest longing is what God alone can pour into you and offer. And so if you, like these few, now understand it and need to come just as you are, then we encourage you to do that as together we stand and sing.